Saturday Night Live is probably the most stressful show on TV. And with that stress, of course, actors and staff will occasionally butt heads. Even if the feuds managed to stay backstage, they definitely had an impact on the show. Here are the members who couldn't stand each other. Chevy Chase and Bill Murray were among the earliest and most notable cast members of Saturday Night Live, but they weren't regulars together. According to Far Out, Chase left the series after about a year, and Murray was his replacement. Chase made his triumphant return to SNL as a guest host in 1978, coming in with what he called in the oral history live from New York a, quote, egocentric attitude. As a result, Chase clashed with multiple cast members, particularly Murray, who knew him from when they worked on National Lampoon per Decider. After many nasty things were said, Murray made a verbal jab at Chase, whose marriage was in a rocky place. Chase retorted by commenting that Murray's scarred face looked like the surface of the moon. Moments before SNL went live on the air, Chase cornered Murray in John Belushi's dressing room and a physical fight broke out, with Belushi having to separate them. News of the fight entered SNL lore, and when Chase hosted the show again in 1980, he and Murray attempted to dispel the so-called rumors by performing I Shot the Sheriff together. First season SNL breakout star Chevy Chase left the show after slightly more than one season and very quickly started appearing in movies. He returned to the show to host eight times, including once in 1985 when he openly and viciously antagonized multiple cast members. Chase approached Robert Downey Jr., son of indie filmmaker Robert Downey Sr., and according to Live from New York, said, "'Didn't your father used to be a successful director? Whatever happened to him? Boy, he sure died, you know. He sure went to hell.'" Downey Sr. was still alive, it's worth noting. He saved some truly audacious vitriol for Terry Sweeney, the first openly gay cast member in SNL history. In Live from New York, Sweeney recalled Chase approaching him with a repulsive idea, with Chase reportedly saying, "'I've got an idea for a sketch for you. How about we say you have AIDS and we weigh you every week?' Producers were so incensed by Chase's comments that they forced him to say sorry, which Sweeney said made Chase furious. The last time Chevy Chase showed his face at Saturday Night Live was a cameo in a March 2013 episode. That's more than a year before Pete Davidson joined the cast of the show, and even though their paths didn't cross, they still managed to forge a feud. In a September 2018 interview with The Washington Post, Chase profanely criticized the show that made him famous. But I'll just say, maybe off the record, I'm amazed that Lauren has gone so low. I had to watch a little bit. I just couldn't effing believe it. A few days after the Post article, Davidson was a guest on Howard Stern's satellite radio show, and the host asked him to respond, which he did, saying, F Chevy Chase. I hate that dude." Davidson noted that Chase seemingly ruined, quote, "...a really big career with his attitude." What really bugged him was how disrespectful Chase's comments were to SNL creator and producer Lorne Michaels. Eddie Murphy is arguably the most prominent star to ever have their career launched by Saturday Night Live. Thanks to his domination of the show in the early 1980s, the hilarious and charismatic young Murphy went on to star in mega-hits like Beverly Hills Cop and The Nutty Professor. And unlike most every other SNL cast member turned A-list film actor, it wasn't until 2019 that Murphy returned to the show to host. The main reason for his absence? Mid-90s SNL cast member David Spade. In a 1995 installment of his snarky talking head segment Spade in America, Spade made a quip over a photo of Murphy, star of back-to-back -back flops Beverly Hills Cop 3 and Vampire in Brooklyn. Look, children, it's a falling star. Make a wish. Yeah, yes, that's right. Murphy told Rolling Stone in 2011 of Spade's cheap shot. What really irritated me about it at the time was that it was a career shot. In the mid-90s, Saturday Night Live underwent a major cast overhaul, bringing in new talent like Will Ferrell, Molly Shannon, and Chris Kattan, with a holdover from the old cast being Norm MacDonald, 
primarily the show's caustic, deadpan weekend update anchor. When Rolling Stone profiled the new SNL ensemble in 1997, McDonald made a point of going after Catan, derisively questioning the mango portrayer's sexuality, seemingly out of nowhere. McDonald also went on to say that he didn't think Catan was funny. Catan initially brushed off his co-star's comments, jokingly responding with his own insult to Norm. In 1999, after McDonald had left SNL and returned to host, Catan, still a cast member, did not appear in the episode, with a source telling The Observer, they had a very acrimonious relationship. Norm would rip Catan to his face. And for his part, Catan would reportedly pester and berate McDonald just before he'd go on air. In the late 90s, Clueless director Amy Heckerling was in negotiations to helm a night at the Roxbury, starring Chris Kattan and Will Ferrell as those two odious dance club regulars who bobbed their heads to Hathaway's What Is Love in a recurring Saturday Night Live sketch. In his memoir, Baby Don't Hurt Me, Kattan claimed that SNL and a night at the Roxbury producer Lorne Michaels was so desperate to sign Heckerling that he encouraged Kattan to accept her romantic advances, which he had previously rejected. Rejected. Catan said that he did as Michaels had asked and began an affair with Heckerling, who ultimately produced but did not direct A Night at the Roxbury. Once production on the movie was completed, Catan wrote that Farrell didn't speak to him for months, then confronted him backstage at SNL, and Catan recalled him saying, I didn't call you back because I didn't want to talk to you. I don't want to be your friend anymore. I'm going to be professional and still work with you on the show, but that's it. Farrell didn't explicitly state his reasons, but Catan understood that his co-star was disgusted by his strange affair with Heckerling. In 2009, years removed from Saturday Night Live, Tracy Morgan published his first book, I Am the New Black. He reflected on his time at SNL in the mid-90s and early 2000s and dished the dirt on which cast members he didn't like, Chris Kattan and Sherry O'Terry, writing, All I have to say about that is, where's Chris Kattan now? Where's Sherry O'Terry now? According to Gawker, when Morgan recorded the audiobook version of I Am The New Black, he elaborated and improvised on his SNL friends and enemies, noting that he considers Will Ferrell, Colin Quinn, and Molly Shannon his friends, but definitely not O'Terry and Catan. Tracy Morgan was a cast member on Saturday Night Live from 1996 to 2003, his tenure largely overlapping that of young comedian and impressionist Jimmy Fallon. While Fallon had some breakout recurring characters, he's likely best and most remembered for collapsing into giggles or hysterical laughter in one sketch after another. It can be argued that laughing, or breaking as it's also known, can ruin a sketch, and Morgan certainly thought Fallon's behavior did just that. In a 2007 interview with Penthouse, Morgan suggested that Fallon would crack up on purpose to put the spotlight on himself, and also that he hated it, saying, "...that's taking all the attention off of everybody else and putting it on you like, oh, look at me, I'm the cute one." Morgan also pointed out that Fallon didn't laugh through sketches they appeared in together because Morgan told him not to. This feud seems to have resolved at least. Morgan was a guest on Late Night with Jimmy Fallon 11 times, and has appeared on Fallon's The Tonight Show on six occasions. In 2011, The Oprah Winfrey Show hosted a large group of Saturday Night Live all-stars, including Tina Fey, Dana Carvey, and Jane Curtin. When Winfrey asked about gender politics in the workplace, Curtin, one of the original members in 1975 and one of the first Weekend Update co-hosts, described an atmosphere of sexism and hostility to women. Jane, you ignorant According to Curtin, co-star John Belushi believed that, quote, "...women are just fundamentally not funny," and alleged that the late SNL star intentionally sabotaged pieces that were written by women. Curtin reiterated her experiences with Belushi on Watch What Happens Live in 2018, explaining that the actor was among a group of men on the show who thought that, quote, "...women should not have been on SNL." When host Andy Cohen asked if Belushi thought SNL standout Gilda Radner had comedy chops, she said that he did, but he didn't classify her as a woman. She was Gilda. Dana Carvey was probably the biggest star on SNL in the late 1980s. When Mike Myers joined the show in 1989, he brought along a character he'd originated on Canadian television and recruited Carvey to play his sidekick. 
Together, they made comedy magic. Wayne's World, a cable access show hosted by Meyer's Wayne Campbell and Carvey's Garth Algar. The sketches performed so well that they spawned two movies. In 1997, Myers created another comedy movie franchise with Austin Powers' International Man of Mystery. In the parody of 1960s British spy movies, Myers portrayed swinging, groovy super spy Austin Powers, as well as the villain Dr. Evil, who spoke with a pronounced and exaggerated Canadian accent. According to Carvey on The Howard Stern Show, Myers' Dr. Evil voice was his take on Carvey's impersonation of their SNL boss, Lorne Michaels. He also allegedly took Dr. Evil's habit of raising a pinky to his lips from Carvey's Michaels impression, saying, "'Lauren doesn't do that, but somehow it fit. The pinky thing I did.'" Carvey resented Myers for years, and the latter did admit to The Hollywood Reporter, "'The Dr. Evil voice is a little bit Lauren Michaels. There are no two ways about it.'" Carvey never confronted Myers, but he claims he did go over it with his therapist. Saturday Night Live creator Lorne Michaels took what became a five-year leave of absence from his show in the early 1980s, and NBC put associate producer Gene Domanian in charge. When Michaels left, so did the entire cast, many of them with SNL from its beginning, meaning Domanian could hire a new roster of players per Live from New York. According to Doug Hill and Jeffrey Weingrad's Saturday Night, Domanian was most excited about Charles Rocket and predicted he'd be the biggest star among the bunch. But the breakout star of the early 80s SNL was not Charles Rocket, it was Eddie Murphy. Perhaps resentful of the success and popularity that came so easily to his co-star, who had joined the show at age 19, Rocket was openly scornful and dismissive of Murphy around the SNL offices. Nora Dunn and Victoria Jackson were among the small group of women to be a part of the Saturday Night Live cast in the mid to late 1980s. They didn't do much for each other, and the rest of their co-stars seemingly didn't like either actor as well. With John Lovitz recounting in Live from New York, Dunn fought with a lot of people. She fought with me the first year, and then the second year she started again and I said, I'm not going through this with you for another year. He then recalled a time when a sketch with Dunn and Dana Carvey ended with those two actors, quote, just screaming at each other. Jackson thought Dunn was the single biggest flaw on SNL, while well, her and another co-star. An SNL producer gathered the cast of this era for a meeting to pinpoint problems with the show, and Jackson recalled, "...no one was saying anything. I stood up and told everyone what was wrong with the show was those two women. I pointed to Nora and Jan Hooks, and all the things they did bad. They didn't cooperate in sketches, and they slammed doors in people's faces, and backbite and backstab and all that." Dunn and Hooks slipped out of the room, and Jackson called out the rest of the cast for not backing her up. That reportedly prompted prompted Carvey to quip, "'You didn't hear anyone disagreeing, did you? Check out one of our newest videos right here!' Plus, even more Nicki Swift videos about your favorite celebrity feuds are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.